Welcome to Fine Art B. This is your Unit 5 test intervention of modern times or modernist art period. So now that I have the quiz opened up, I can go through each question one at a time. Here's question number one. How did Henri Matisse use a convention of fauvism and Madame Matisse the green line? Answer, is it Matisse gave the subject a traditional portrait pose? Is it Matisse outlined the figure so that it became more important than the background? Look at it, what do you think? Is it Matisse used simplified shapes filled with bold expressive color? Or is it Matisse added details to place the subject in historical context? Which one of those seemed to make the most sense to you? Now that you um, kind of have a guess what you think it might be, based on your background knowledge and, and just what you perceive, let's take a look real quick at the PowerPoint. Objectives today, if you read them out loud with me, that would be great. I can identify characteristics of modernist art. I can identify different styles that emerged during the period of modernism. And this will all be demonstrated by getting an A on the Unit 5 test. So, Fauvism, everybody say that, Fauvism, started in 1899 and ended in 1908. And here are some of the works of Fauvist artists. Fauvism was the first 20th century movement in modern art. The Fauves, which literally means wild beasts, were a loosely allied group of French painters who shared interests. Several of them, including Henri Matisse, Albert Marquet, and Georges Rolle, had been pupils of the symbolist artist Gustave Moreau and admired the older artist's emphasis on personal expression. Matisse emerged as the leader of the group, whose members shared the use of intense color as a vehicle for describing light and space and who redefined pure color and form as means of communicating the artist's emotional state. In these regards, Fauvism proved to be an important precursor to Cubism and Expressionism, as well as a touchstone for future modes of abstraction. So that's just an overview of Fauvism, and that's going to bring us to the first painting, the first question on the test that we've already looked at, and this um, question addresses Henri Matisse's Madame Matisse, The Green Line. And this painting was done in 1905. It depicts Matisse's wife. And these simplified shapes filled with bold expressive color make up where you might normally see light and shadow. The effects of light and shadow, which would have added depth to the image, have been translated into planes of color instead. Matisse was engaged in ever wilder painterly experiments intended to release color from its descriptive function, allowing it to act as a force in its own right. So now let's go back and see if we can find the answer together. Let me show you how to open up this PowerPoint that I'm using for this video. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click here on the Fine Art B Unit 5 test intervention. This right here indicates that it's an Adobe Acrobat um, program, which is a PowerPoint. And um, you can actually just view this content in a new window by clicking here. And you can shut out this window right here. And now here you are you've got your test is open and you've got the PowerPoint open at the same time. So let's look at the question again. It says, how did Henri Matisse use a convention of Fauvism and Madame Matisse the green line? Well, let's look at the possible answers. Matisse gave the subject a traditional portrait pose. Do we talk about traditional portraiture here? No. Matisse outlined the figure so that it became more important. Hmm, was Matisse trying to outline the figure? Was that one of the main objectives of this movement of the Fauvist artists? No. Matisse used simplified shapes filled with bold expressive color. 
That sounds more familiar. The Phobos wanted to give color more importance and allow it to, remember, act as a force in its own right, right? And he did simplify the shapes with bold and expressive colors. So the answer here would be C. We could look at the last one. Matisse added details to place the subject in a historical context. There really aren't a lot of details suggesting anything historical here. There may be some details, like for example, the way her hair is pulled up, that certainly does date her style, and, and the style of dress might date her as well. But there aren't a lot of historical clues. So that's how you're going to take this test. And I'm going to go ahead and continue with this slideshow, but it will be your job to actually pause the video and go through each question and answer each question. I've included lots of reference material in this PowerPoint. So um, if you are interested in learning more, then um, be sure to take advantage of these opportunities. Here's a nice video, um, Art with Mati and Dada by, about Henry Matisse. And um, you can just do a YouTube search um, for this title and it will come up. So question number two in our second image here is also by Henri Matisse. It's called The Red Room. It was painted from 1908 to 1909. Notice the strong, bold use of primary colors, red, blue, and green. The green window and simple shapes of the plants lead the viewer's eye outside, giving the painting a sense of depth. The painting has an overall decorative pattern effect and a flattened sense of space. If you'd like to learn more about this image, watch this video, Harmony in Red. Our next period of modernism is Expressionism. It started in about 1905 and ended around 1933. Expressionism emerged simultaneously in various cities across Germany as a response to a widespread anxiety about humanity's increasingly discordant relationship with the world and accompanying lost feelings of authenticity and spirituality. It was also in part a reaction against Impressionism and academic art. Expressionists exhibited distortion of form and the deployment of strong colors to convey a variety of anxieties and yearnings. This movement spread throughout Europe. Its example would later inform abstract expressionism, and its influence would be felt throughout the remainder of the century in German art. It was also a critical precursor to the neo-expressionist artists of the 1980s. Here's your overview. So let's look at number three, Wassily Kandinsky, Improvisation 31, painted in 1913. This is a sea battle. Can you see the mass of the two different ships? What do you think the jagged lines represent? It uses distortion and exaggeration for emotional impact. And if you'd like to learn more, you can watch Interpretation of Kandinsky's Improvisation 31 on YouTube. Number four, Kata Kalwitz, Self-Portrait, 1849. She was a social activist when Hitler came to power. She emotionally addressed contemporary issues of social justice and personal loss. She was repeatedly threatened by the Gestapo. She lost her studio. The Nazi government censored her, preventing her from exhibiting her messages. The end of her career was marked by pain and self-reflection. A theme of her work was the mother protecting her child. This is her self-portrait. And can you see how the Holocaust impacted her vision and importance of a mother protecting the child? You can watch Kata Kolwitz, The Face of Early 20th Century Expressionism, Socialism, Feminism, and Pacifism on YouTube. Cubism started around 1907 
and ended with the First World War. Here's a little overview. The artist abandoned perspective, which had been used to depict space since the Renaissance. And they also turned away from the realistic modeling of figures. Cubist explored open form, piercing figures and objects by letting the space flow through them, blending background into foreground and showing objects from various angles. Some historians have argued that these innovations represent a response to the changing experience of space, movement, and time in the modern world. This first phase of the movement was called analytic cubism. In the second phase of cubism, synthetic cubists explored the use of non-art materials as abstract signs. Their use of newspaper would lead later historians to argue that, instead of being concerned above all with form, the artists were acutely aware of current events, particularly World War I. Number five, Pablo Picasso, Portrait of Ambrios Voyard, 1910. Ambrios Voyard was an art dealer respected and painted by Cezanne, Renoir, Roald, Bonnard. His bald head is exploding and Voyard's eyes is, bro is a broken architecture of shards of flesh or brick colored painting. Planes that have been started and stopped as if in a slow motion exaggerated cartoon of the movement a painter makes between looking up, recording on the canvas the detail he sees, and looking back. Influenced by Cezanne, Picasso reduced objects to their simplest forms. Number six, Georges Brock. That shouldn't be uh, italicized. <laughs> That's his name, Georges Brock. And the name of the artwork is Still Life, Le Jour, 1929. Le Jour in French means the day. How does the eye perceive objects? This is what Georges Brock was trying to do with the viewer. Take reality, slice it up, turn it around and put it together in a way we've never seen it before. Some objects are flattened shapes and some have a sense of form. It's a play on levels of reality and levels of representation. His painting is at the National Gallery of Art and there's a great video. Uh, watch this video at the National Gallery of Art website um, if you're interested in see, learning more. Meanwhile, all that's in Europe, right? Meanwhile in America, we've got um, this movement called social realism. It started around 1929 or earlier during the time of the depression and ended in the 1950s, um, some would argue earlier. The social realist political movement and artistic explorations flourished primarily during the 1920s and 30s, a time of global economic depression, heightened racial conflict, the rise of fascist regimes internationally, and great optimism after both the Mexican and Russian revolutions. Social realists created figurative and realistic images of the masses, a term that encompassed the lower and working classes, labor unionists, and the politically disenfranchised. American artists became dissatisfied with the French avant-garde in their own isolation from greater society, which led them to search for a new vocabulary and a new social importance. They found their purpose in the belief that art was a weapon that could fight the capitalist exploitation of workers and stem the advance of international fascism. Social realism continued. The social realist political movement and artistic explorations flourished primarily, oh, is that the exact same? <laughs> Whoops, I might have forgotten to delete that slide. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so number seven, Ben Sean, The Passion of Sacco and Vanzetti, 1931-32. So first of all, take a look at this painting and make some inferences, make some predictions. What do you think this painting's about? Well, this is one of 23 paintings about the controversial trial of two working class Italian American immigrants who were sentenced to death based on weak circumstantial 
evidence. The case caused public outrage. Many believed they were the victims of ethnic discrimination, right-wing politics, and a corrupt police investigation. Flat shapes and sharp angular forms create the abstract, unsympathetic commissioners who upheld the death penalty after years of appeal. Judge Webster Thayer is inside taking an oath. The lilies are symbolic of Christ, suggesting Sacco and Vanzetti are martyrs punished for sins they did not commit. So that was in America. And meanwhile, back in Europe, Cubism continues with Pablo Picasso's Guernica, 1937. This painting is a large mural in response to the news of the German aerial bombing of the town of Guernica. Picasso conveys the suffering of civilians through the use of fragmented, distorted shapes. It is a plea against the barbarity and terror of war. It is a testimony to the horror that the Spanish Civil War was causing, that was Pablo Picasso's homeland, Spain, and a forewarning of what was to come in the Second World War. This painting, with purposely muted color, is an emblem for all the devastating tragedies of modern society. Surrealism. Starting about 1924, ending around 1966, the surrealist artists sought to channel the unconscious as a mean to unlock the power of the imagination, disdaining rationalism and literary realism and powerfully influenced by psychoanalysts, the surrealists believed the rational mind repressed the power of the imagination, weighing it down with taboos. Influenced also by Karl Marx, they hoped that the psyche had the power to reveal the contradictions in the everyday world and spur on revolution. Their emphasis on the power of personal imagination puts them in the tradition of romanticism. But unlike their forebears, they believed that revelations could be found on the street and in everyday life. The surrealist impulse to tap the unconscious mind and their interests in myth and primitivism went on to shape many later movements and the style remains influential to this day. Number nine, Salvador Dali, The Persistence of Memory, 1931. A hand-painted dream photograph, that is how Dali described his works. Seaside landscape based on his home in Spain. So this is where he actually lived, right here by the seaside. Time is the theme here from the melting watches to the decay implied by the swarming ants, which you can't see very well in this image, but there are ants swarming on this watch. Dolly painted fantasy scenes by using fine brushwork and technical precision to make them believable. So he spent a lot of time giving it a realistic style. Number 10, Joan Miro. Dutch Interior, 1, 1928. This is based on Hendrik Martens Sorg's painting, The Lutenist, from 1661. Miro used abstract shapes, curving lines, and amoeba-like forms to reject the naturalist 17th century Dutch painting style. He accentuates the lute and the man's head and ruffled collar while diminishing other subject matter. Can you see the similarities and differences? And now back in America, we've got regionalism. Started around 1924 and ended in 1966. So regionalism is just basically painting scenes from the different regions of America and basing them on life in those regions. One of the most famous is number 11, Grant Wood's American Gothic, 1930. The couple is grim. Slavery has been abolished. The depression is daunting. 
the woman is actually the farmer's daughter, not his wife. A straggling lock of hair, liberated by work, softens her expression. A closer look at her eyes reveals the worry. Industrialization is taking America by storm, while these people remain frozen in time. The window frame is literally from the Gothic period, but their old-fashioned clothing and hairstyles are cynically referred to as Gothic. In the spirit of American regionalism, it idealizes Midwestern virtues in an ironic juxtaposition with Gothic architecture and 15th century Flemish painting style, later referred to as Gothic painting. It's a great video, Grant Wooden 60 Seconds by the Royal Academy of Arts that you could watch in another great article here. Number 12, Edward Hopper, Nighthawks, 1942. Looking into the space of the diner through these glass windows makes you really aware of your separation, amplifying the science. Silence, sorry. He's imposed strict geometric shapes on the lives of the people. The themes we can find here are wartime separation, human isolation in modern American society. It's the height of the Second World War Many people have left and are overseas fighting. No one knows what is going to happen to the world. Modern architecture. The leading innovators of modern architecture turned away from illustriously ornamental traditional church designs. Modern architects consider function, the people using the spaces, and ways to use new materials and technologies that are at their disposal to create a volume of space enclosed by light. The visual aesthetic of modern architecture was largely inspired by the machine and by abstract painting and sculpture. Number 13, Le Cabousier, Notre Dame du Haut, 1954. An example of 20th century religious architecture. At the end of World War II, and designers are turning to science and technology. Le Cabossier sprayed concrete onto steel mesh to sculpt the roof in an upward shape, upward swept shape. The chapel is a white arch with openings for colored glass. By construction and spatial organization, the two essential elements of creation are highlighted, matter and light. Modern sculpture. The early modern period, circa 1850 to 1900, witnessed a departure from smooth, precise realism in favor of light distortion. During the period, circa 1900 to World War I, distortion was pushed to radical extremes, ultimately reaching the point of utter abstraction. It should be noted that traditional styles, pre-modern styles of sculpture have never gone out of production. This is explained by the timeless appeal of traditional sculpture, especially for public monuments. Many of the great civic monuments of the United States, for example, Mount Rushmore and the Lincoln Memorial statue, for instance, are rendered in traditional styles, despite being 20th century works. Number 15, Amadeo Modigliani, Head of a Woman, 1912. Modigliani was Jewish, born in Italy, late 19th century. The sculpture is made of limestone. It has a strong connection to African sculpture. The facial features are reduced to simple geometric shapes. These abstracted, elongated heads had a significant stylistic impact on his subsequent figure and portrait paintings. Number 16, Henry Moore, Mother and Child. 1953. Moore uses abstracted, simplified, and exaggerated forms. The caption reads, here he distorts the figure to suggest the submission of the mother to the aggressive needs of the child. Henry and his wife, Irina, suffered several miscarriages, and then Irina's mother also died before their daughter was born. The misery and suffering after World War II 
was accentuated by the discovery of the Nazi concentration camps, the death tolls, the injured, and the soldiers returning from mainland Europe to a devastated homeland. With poverty, illness, and unemployment, the whole of Europe was in a state of turmoil and upheaval. This sculpture creates a parallel between mother and child, country and its people. That war-torn and impoverished Britain was strangling its people as much as its starving and rationed people were hungry to eat of it. Abstract Expressionism started 1943 and did 1965. Abstract Expressionism was never an ideal label for the movement which grew up in New York in the 1940s and 50s. It was somehow meant to encompass not only the work of painters who filled their canvases with fields of color and abstract forms, but also those who attacked their canvases with a vigorous gestural expressionism. Yet abstract expressionism has become the most accepted term for a group of artists who did hold much in common. All were committed to an expressive art of profound emotion and universal themes, and most were shaped by the legacy of surrealism, a movement that they translated into a new style fitted to the post-war mood of anxiety and trauma. In their success, the New York painters robbed Paris of its mantle as leader of modern art and set the stage for America's post-war dominance of the international art world. Number 17, Jackson Pollock, Autumn Rhythm, number 30, 1950. To many, the large eloquent canvases of 1950 are Pollock's greatest achievements. Autumn Rhythm, painted in October of that year, exemplifies the extraordinary balance between accident and control that Pollock maintained over his technique. The words poured and dripped, commonly used to describe his unorthodox creative process, which involved painting on unstretched canvas laid flat on the floor, hardly suggest the diversity of the artist's movements, flicking, splattering, and dribbling, or the lyrical, often spiritual compositions they produced. Number 18, Willem de Kooning, Woman One, 1950 to 1952. The hulking, wild-eyed subject draws upon an amalgam of female archetypes from Paleolithic fertility goddess to contemporary pinup girls. Her threatening stare and ferocious grin combined voluptuousness and menace. De Kooning used aggressive gestures to apply slashing lines in all directions. The portrait reflects the age-old cultural ambivalence between reverence for and fear of the power of the feminine. And postmodernism starts 1970s and I have yet to find an end date. Postmodernism is a response to and critique on modernism. Use of multimedia to engage the viewer. Art is a critical investigation, said one Jasper Johns. It is marked by an attitude of skepticism, irony, and distrust toward anything we believe to be true. It plays with, satirizes, and deconstructs social constructs. It argues that there is no absolute truth. And there are a couple of postmodernism videos to just try to help you kind of understand what in the world postmodernism is. Postmodernism is post because it denies the existence of any ultimate principles and it lacks the optimism of there being a scientific, philosophical, or religious truth which will explain everything for everybody, a characteristic of the so-called modern mind. The paradox of the postmodern position is that, in placing all principles under the scrutiny of its skepticism, it must realize that even its own principles are not beyond questioning. As the philosopher Richard Tarnas states, Postmodernism cannot on its own principles ultimately justify itself any more than can the various metaphysical overviews against which the postmodern mind has defined itself. Number 19, Robert Rosenberg Estate, 1963. A process he called combines features layered and repeated silk screened images on what have been called flatbed picture planes. 
Seemingly spontaneous splashes of paint recall the vocabulary of abstract expressionism. Estate features images of American popular culture that the general public would recognize, such as the Statue of Liberty, Michelangelo's painting Last Judgment, a 1962 rocket launch, and a glass of water. It draws its power from the tension between photography and painting, including vigorous and uneven brush strokes and repeated and tilted images throughout the composition. It evokes the era in which all categories of culture coexisted in a reality increasingly mediated by television, radio, and advertising. Number 21. What are the similarities between the sculptures of Henry Moore and Amadeo, Amadeo Modigliani? They both simplify and abstract elements of the human form. Number 22. How do these two artists treat space differently? Well, Hopper is still using perspective to create space. He's creating depth in his painting, whereas Picasso, the cubist, threw perspective out the window. The fractured shapes flattened the space. Submit your test. Did you get an A? If not, restart the test, slow down, and do your best. Have a great week.